everybody. Welcome back to the Consummate Athlete Podcast. I'm Molly Herford, and when I'm not outside doing things, I'm inside writing about doing the things. And I'm Peter Glassford. I'm an endurance coach and registered kinesiologist. Crushing the short intros lately. Uh, I think mine's always quite short. That one was reversed, but... All right. Well, I'm mixing it up. Mine has gotten shorter. Yes. <laughs> Very pleased with myself. Anyway, um, today's guest I'm super excited about. Uh, she's one of my best friends in the, the universe. We've spent countless months and weeks traveling with her at this point. Um, we've you know, helped out with her camps. We've hung out with her at the biggest races in the world. So obviously today's guest is Ellen Noble. So, yay! Yes, very excited, as I'm sure many of the listeners are. Um, Ellen's very popular on social medias, and also you've probably watched her race on some of the Red Bull coverage uh, of either mountain biking or uh, cyclocross. Um, So it's very exciting watching her. Um, What else? She is a Red Bull athlete as well. She is. She races for Trek Factory Racing, which... Peter is also on the, the Trek Ellen, bike. Ellen and I are teammates. <laughs> yes, 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 that's what we're going to call it. Yes. Um, Ellen runs an awesome Ellen Noble Cyclocross Quest camp out in Western Mass, where this year we had 18 young women out learning kind of all the ins and outs of racing cyclocross at a really high level. Uh, Ellen went from that into the first rounds of World Cups and... You know, she was the only one in the Waterloo World Cup that was able to respond to Mariana, Mariana Voss's attacks. She was actually leading the race for most of it. It was one of the most exciting races it was pretty I've good. ever watched. Yeah, a few people were proclaiming it the best race of all time. I've never been so hoarse after a race, and I've also watched Ellen race to second place in U23 World Championships a couple of years ago. And then Ellen... I think where I, it's close to my heart is that she's also pushed the limits of uh, women's skill, I would say, in cyclocross, especially mm-hmm. with her barrier hopping or bunny hopping the patriarchy. Um, so that's also awesome and uh, sort of helped her and got her both probably some race wins, but then also uh, I think people have really gotten behind that whole concept of pushing women's racing forward, right? Yeah, and actually in Europe now there are a lot of women who are starting to hop when the barriers are out in races and are kind of in optimal hopping position. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that's pretty cool. So we'll talk a lot about that today. Yeah. So I have to call back, like I first met Ellen when she was, I think, 13 years old. I was at her first ever cyclocross clinic. She'd raced cross, I think maybe once or twice at that point. And she showed up to Adam Meyerson's Cycle Smart Cyclocross Clinic back when I was living in Western Mass, uh, just down the road from where she currently lives. Um, she showed up and I remember, you know, she was this mountain biker that really wanted to learn how to race cross. Uh, Emma White was there. Those of you who follow cyclocross probably also know Emma White, who races for Cannondale Cyclocross World. Um, and she and Ellen at, you know, this early teenage stage were both kind of the fastest women at this cyclocross camp. And I remember Adam coming up to me and saying, that's going to be one of the biggest rivalries we're going to see in 10 years. Um, and barring the fact that uh, Emma is now training on the track for the 2020 Olympics, uh, last year we saw that Adam was actually correct. And that is one of the biggest rivalries. And well, I think Adam's generally right. Is yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, if you, have if you a... ask him, he's always. Yes. <laughs> and and it, I mean, I, I don't know Adam super well, but I have all the respect for him. If you haven't checked out, he has a wide angle podium show. It's not as consistent as ours, but he has a couple episodes that are really, really good. Um, That's the Meyerson line? The Meyerson line, yep. Yeah, if you look that up. And he also owns Cycle Smart Coaching, and they do still do those same clinics. So you could go down and do a clinic with many of those these characters that we'll discuss today. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, seeing, you know, thinking back to Ellen and Emma at that age um, actually is, you know, part of the inspiration around me writing the Shred Girl series, to be honest. You know, watching those young girls become, you know, make friends with people in the sport, you know, grow up in the sport, um, have the community that's provided by being in cyclocross. Um, all of that stuff kind of helped push me to develop the Shred Girls books. Um, so to kind of throw a plug for that out, uh, the pre-order for Shred Girls, the first one, Lindsay's Joyride, is actually open right now. You can find that. We'll link it in the show notes and everything. And if you pre-order ahead of 
say December 22nd, I'll have stuff in the mail for you. It won't be the book, but I do have stickers and postcards that I will be sending out to anyone who pre-orders and emails me the receipt. That way, if you're giving it for Christmas, you have something to put under the tree, even if it isn't the actual book yet. That's very exciting. Yeah. You know, a lot of people are, already have their pre-orders in. Mm-hmm. Um, are we going to have to like stuff a bunch of envelopes full yes, of we will. decals? Yes. You got really <laughs> caught off guard by I, decal. I did. Do I have to translate that? Yeah. Um, yeah. And then... How about you? What are you uh, up to? This week, we're back uh, in Collingwood. So I'm doing a couple consults or a few consults. Uh, we got booked in at the gym and stuff. So people come in and we work on whatever. It could be a test. It could be more on the sort of bike fit mobility side of things. It could be like a strength session. Uh, so I really enjoy the session. Sort of like an hour or so where we're just one-on-one and working on whatever, you know, generally cyclists are, are coming in for those. Obviously, that's sort of where I spend most of my time. Uh, but yeah, they're really, really good. Often people I don't necessarily coach, uh, you know, on an ongoing basis. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I really like that. That's sort of where I'd, I'd love to see more of my life go as towards the sessions like that. And then, yeah, just getting people going, as I've been saying the last few weeks, end of season, starting the season, starting to put hay in the barn. Yep, lots of uh, lots of New Year's resolutions, you know, things coming up. So I feel like you're kind of constantly on the phone at this point, doing calls with clients, co- like consults with people that are kind of thinking about next year's training plans and race goals and all of that. Yeah, and I try not to do as much in that like week or two around Christmas, but yeah, that's definitely it's the season, right? Like even just irregardless of resolutions, it's just you know the the clock's starting to tick for whatever race. Mm -hmm. Yes, and for Ellen, the clock is ticking down towards nationals, which are happening uh, this upcoming weekend. So USA Cycling will be broadcasting them live. So highly, highly recommend that you watch them because the men's and the women's races are going to be bonkers this year. I'm super stoked. So without further ado, let's get in and talk to Ellen about how she got into cyclocross, her best cyclocross tips, and what she's thinking about for nationals. Okay. Ellen Noble, you. So this is the Consummate Athlete Podcast, and while we're obviously going to focus on cycling, I feel like you have one of the most consummate athlete childhoods out of any human that I've ever met. So yes, <laughs> can we start with just like the laundry list of the sports that you participated in growing yeah. up? Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. Let's make sure I get them all. Um, I. Like super, com- super competitively played hockey and ran in high school, as well as wrestled. Um, I snowboarded, I skateboarded, um, I raced BMX. Well, I guess that's in- that includes cycling. Um, I did dance, gymnastics. Um, maybe that might be it. What were you the <laughs> best at out of all of them? Um, hockey, uh, maybe running. I think hockey probably, but maybe running. And what was they your, were tied. what was your hockey position? I actually played basically all of them. Um, I mostly was left wing. Um, but then I played center a little bit. So I like the, the positions that I was best, at, I was probably best at playing forward, but I would get moved around a bit depending on what I was playing. Like when I was on the, uh, like I was on the main state women's team and so I would play forward but then for a while I played defense I think in on the men's team or like on the high school team because I was getting or maybe I played forward I can't remember I was getting destroyed because like the boys had hit puberty and I was still 5'2 <laughs> and I would just get laid up in these games like so badly so I um I got moved around a little bit and I think that's why I started playing center for a little bit as well even though I didn't have super great hand eye coordination um I was able, they were just trying to keep me from breaking my tailbone again, basically was like why I kept getting moved around. Um, So I think that's why D was good because I could, I, it was mostly about me skating really fast um, and less about getting like completely destroyed. (laughs) I feel like we had similar hockey experiences. I always was playing defense though. And I just kept getting crushed every time. I just go into the corner, get crushed. And then they're like, oh, take a (laughs) peed out again. (laughs) There was one of my favorite jokes that's never very well received was, and maybe this is a bit insensitive now, but it was, why do they have to stop playing leprosy hockey? Because there was a face off in the corner. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> we are going to have to get sound effects for this episode. <laughs> he said that he that he wasn't he had to every time he went into the corner. So I had to. Yeah, I had yeah. to. We're it's, talking about hockey in the corner. <laughs> it's, it's fair. All right. Uh, m- moving on. Which sport were you the worst Wait, at? I have a follow up. Oh, oh. Yeah. So I have a theory that people need to play sliding sports at a young age, and then this helps them gr- quite a bit, especially in the off-road cycling disciplines. Um, agree or disagree, and do you have anything to add to this concept? Sliding sports, like, Ski, like skating? Skiing, skating. Oh, I, also, um, I did Nordic skiing. I forgot about that one. You're from Maine. And swimming. That's a swim. Oh, my God. I forgot I also swam. <laughs> <laughs> So two more to the list. <laughs> um, no, absolutely. I think that it's super good. Like, that's why I've had actually, like, knock on wood, but I've had like pretty good luck with my kind of cycling career is I, um, whereas like a lot of people were having kind of like overuse issues with their hips and knees, like because I did a bunch of other sports that weren't just a pedaling motion growing up, I developed potentially overdeveloped a lot of muscles in different areas that have allowed me to become like a much more like well-balanced, um, human being. <laughs> right. Yeah, definitely. I agree with you on that one, Peter. Um, Molly, to answer your question, I think we would have to ask mom and dad on on that one. But I think my mom would probably tell you gymnastics, although I I'm not good at dancing. Like, there's really no way around it. <laughs> I was not good at it, but I and I had at least I was really good at well, really good by comparatively really good. Is this like bars. a main comparison or where are we comparing? Well, no, compared to like the other um, events or what would be the word? Oh, I'm like, not just. I thought you meant like you were. I was stuck on dancing. Like I was like, no, you, you no, were like no. a dancing champion in Maine? No, that's my sister. My sister was, my sister's really good at dancing, but mm-hmm. I am not. Um, so yeah, I probably gymnastics because I thought I was pretty good at gymnastics. Or, like, I really wanted to be, whereas I didn't really care about dance, but I loved gymnastics like it was the first sport I actually loved doing um so to be not good at it was really depressing like I (laughs) this is a random aside but I um went to a competition when I was like probably 10 this was the last competition I went to and I was really excited because I had finished on the podium it was a five-person podium because they do that gymnastics I finished on the podium in all of the disciplines I was fifth in all of them and I was fourth on bars and then <laughs> I was in the competition, I found out that there were only five people in my group. And I was so upset. And I remember crying on the way home and I was like, I'm terrible. And my parents were like, hey, your words, not ours. <laughs> <laughs> and <I quit. laughs> that was it for me. I was like, why am I dedicating my life to a thing I'm not good at? My parents were like, yes, now she's going to try biking. And I did. Okay, well, I have to back up to the five-person podium. Yay or nay for the five-person well, this podium. This is the Wide Angle Podium Network. I know, but we got to ask. You can't ask questions like um, that. For gymnastics, I, I think yes, but in cycling, no. <laughs> I don't know. Hot how, topic. What is the actual, uh, po- like, what is our podcast network stance on that? I don't know. Is it tongue in cheek, or are we actually? I don't really, know. Because they're. Really... I would. I would imagine it's tongue in cheek, but yeah. if it's not, that's fine as Bill's well. Bill's really particular about the ordering of the boxes on the yes. plot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Bill is quite particular, and I think it's good. I think it's he's got a lot of experience. He's an interesting man. Mm-hmm. Anyway, though, so you know, you you quit gymnastics, and did you then pick up cycling from that, or? Let's let's get into the cycling background. Yeah, I had been I had like been biking with my parents my whole life, um, but I did. I think I I mean like I didn't start taking cycling seriously until I was like fifteen. Um, but yeah, I think my parents were hoping that like very slowly the other sports would get phased out and then cycling would come into it. Just because like my dad had noticed from a pretty young age that I had I had this skill set like I had like a pretty natural ability at riding a bike. Um, like there are pictures of me from when I was five pedaling that I swear to God look like me riding now. Like I had like good <laughs> form and stuff. Like it's crazy. And I always had that, like, I had that look, like I've always been super, super competitive. Um, and I had like huge lungs. Like as a kid, I had to go to the doctor because I was having a hard time breathing, but they found out that I just had such a big lung capacity for such a small child that I was like, I was having a hard time breathing enough to fill my big lungs. So my parents were like, 
Oh yeah, she's gonna be great. <laughs> and <laughs> your parents were also pretty serious cyclists themselves, and your mom is still crazy athletic. Yeah, yeah. So like, both of my parents were super athletic. Like, my dad was like hockey star, and my mom was like the running queen. Um, and like, she used to compete with Joan Benoit and stuff like in at like the main running races and stuff like that. Um, so like, both of my parents were super athletic and um, were like really, really into cycling together. Um, they, they were like really serious in the kind of like local elite hero way. Whereas like we look back now at what my parents were doing when they thought they were like super legit and laugh. But at the time they were like, Oh yeah, like this is, (laughs) this is peak performance. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And your mom was doing ultras like before it was cool to do stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. My mom, when I was like seven or eight, my mom did a three day ultra that was like I don't know kayaking distance but it was something messed up they like kayaked from Canada to Vermont and then the next day they did a 31 mile run up and over Jay Peak and then the next day they did a 78 mile mountain bike race around Jay Peak so my mom did a marathon in between two other races (laughs) yeah your mom is my hero (laughs) yes She's pretty amazing. And she hasn't run the same since like that race basically ended her career. But I mean, she did it. So it was pretty sick. (laughs) What a way to go. (laughs) What a way to go. (laughs) Okay, so you you started on I mean, you did a bit of BMX, but mountain biking was really more your thing before cyclocross. Yeah, yeah, I, I've raced mountain bikes like my whole life. And Mountain biking in New England growing up is not the mountain biking that we have come to know and love now, like that you watch on Red Bull TV. Um, so like my transition back to mountain bike racing felt like I was kind of doing something completely different than what I grew up doing. It didn't, it didn't feel like a homecoming necessarily. It wasn't like, ah, the familiarity of mountain bike racing. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, I grew up doing like, they were like three hour races, maybe Maybe they're they're supposed to be like two hours, but when you're 11, (laughs) there's three hours. (laughs) So yeah, I grew up doing that with my parents and we would go on group rides and like ride with, like ride with the men. It'd be like my mom and I, and then like a bunch of guys and my dad's, they would be like, this is men's only. And my dad's rule was, well, if you can't drop them, it's not going to be men's only. (laughs) (laughs) That's such a good rule. You know, my dad was like OG feminist before feminist was cool. (laughs) (laughs) So throughout all of this, I mean, obviously there were going to be some hard rides, hard races when you're 11 and riding with adults. Did you ever have like the moment where you like threw the bike and were like, I'm not doing this anymore. This is dumb and I hate it. Um, I had a, I've had a lot more of those, I think lately, <laughs> than I did. <laughs> <laughs> but, but to be honest, like, when I was a kid, I actually, I don't think I had a lot of those. I mean, I did like learning how to ride and stuff was quite challenging, but like you said, there were the occasional rides, but like, I actually really, really wanted to love cycling. And it was like, it was like every Disney channel movie where like, they like want to love like the thing that their dad loves. Like they want to be good at basketball or whatever. Um, but I was, I was really struggling because like, I actually wanted to love it and I didn't. Like I couldn't connect with cycling, but I really wanted it. Cause like my parents loved it. And like, I really loved my parents and like, I thought they were really cool. So I wanted to do what they were doing. And so it was like a really, really, it was like a lot of inner turmoil for me at like 13 being like, I really want to like this, but I actually don't get very excited by it. And that's when I started doing cyclocross or like when I started doing cyclocross, it brought something different to bike riding for me that kind of allowed me to see cycling entirely in a different like from a different perspective Mm -hmm. um so that was like that was really huge for me and I think like growing up I was only riding with men and I was doing like these really 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 long races that kind of didn't that lacked that um that draw or like that appeal and then I got to a cyclocross race look park 2011 and there were like 80 or 90 women lined up at 8 a.m. And it was like 10 degrees. It was so messed up cold out. And there were like, there was an unquantifiable amount of people at the start line. (laughs) Yeah. I was like, oh my God, this is like, this is what I've been looking for. Like, and people were cheering and stuff. Like it was really exciting. And so it held something very different for me. And I, I did like genuinely fall in love with the sport after that. But yeah, I had a lot of those moments where I was like, 
I think I'm good. Like, and like I said, I, I, I still have those now where I'm like, is this the sport for me? And I have, I have like a really beautiful group of people that I like love and respect that are also bike racers. And I, and I've asked a couple of them, like, have you ever wondered if maybe this isn't the sport for you? I had this conversation with Katie Compton last week and she was like, yep. I want <laughs> Uh, and one of my other kind of resources that said, I, I think if you don't question that, then <laughs> then maybe your heart isn't fully in it. Like if you're not like actually kind of, if sometimes you don't think, yeah, you know what? I'd be good if I stopped doing this. <laughs> 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 yeah, then maybe you're not challenging yourself enough. Was it, I have a couple questions off of that, but was it like, what was specifically in that Luck Park race? Like, was it just the nature of cyclocross itself or was it you know was there more similar others to yourself there so you knew like you weren't alone or what what sort of what do you think hooked you I think it was the it was the like sheer number of women that were competing that I found super inspiring um like the mountain bike races that I was doing we would get like three or four women at most of these races you like you start you disappear into the woods for several hours and then you come back like there's no hanging out or anything like if you won or if you were dead last it was all the same like I don't even know if they did podiums maybe they did but it wasn't like there wasn't the presentation that we see now with these kind of events so it was like there was no real connection there was no social aspect and at 15 that's like the social component I think is actually really important. Um, and that's why, like, as we've noted, as we experienced the summer with the camp, like quest with the quest, like <laughs> no one said, no, for the record, no one said camp. <laughs> What's a camp. Um, I'm going to bleep that. <laughs> <laughs> did she say? <laughs> They're going to be like, what? what did they bleep out? <laughs> well, why would, that doesn't even make sense. Peter, you were supposed to keep us from the inside jokes. You ruined Sorry. it. Um, anyway, at the quest this summer, we, we allowed the young women to interact and socialize a lot. Um, yeah, sometimes was the, what was that, Peter? It, it was amazing. Yeah. Like just, yeah, it was amazing because like, that's the kind of thing that keeps you coming back to the sport when it is really hard. And like when the racing isn't going well, like creating that support network that brings, that makes cycling more than just cycling. Like. And that's the thing we were talking at the beginning of this um, at the podcast about like the sports that I did growing up. And I think like at the end of it, like, yes, I was probably best at cycling. Um, but I think if I had put like if you're an athletic person, if you put effort into any sport or most sports, like there are other sports that I had similar like skill sets for. But like at the end of the day, I found a community of people that I cared about in cycling before I found that in anywhere else. It's sort of that and then what you are willing to, you know, keep trying at, right? Because so much of it is, are you willing to invest years, right? Decade. Yeah, absolutely. And it's funny because I hadn't really looked at like the longevity of cycling compared to other sports. But like at the end of the day, I found a sport that I can do professionally for a long time. Whereas like a lot of the other sports like hockey, it sort of stops after college. And so I was thinking the other day, if I, if I could do it all over again, I would love to be on a like on a D1 collegiate team for something. Like I see all these girls traveling together and they all have like matching outfits and stuff, which is really trivial, but like they seem to have a very tight knit group. But then I realized like it's probably really, really hard for them at graduation because they're all going their separate ways and a lot of them won't go on to play professionally just because of kind of the culture of There's collegiate. Not much there, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I do feel super fortunate to have kind of albeit randomly selected a sport that gives me a lot more just beyond college. Yeah. It's super funny. I was talking to someone today as we were like doing a series of articles and the one person was mentioning like, Oh, the guy on this team is 42. He's the oldest professional racer in North America. And I was like, um, actually I'd like to interject. There are several women. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I like start like listing people and I was like, Oh, wow. Well, Laura Van Gilder just posted today that she's headed over to Mole for uh, Masters World Champs, yes. and she said it was 10 years after her first World Championship. She started at, she was 44 when she did her first elite cyclocross World Championship. Yeah. Wow. Uh, that's, like, kind of the sickest thing ever. When I saw it, I was like, oh my god, I love her. She's so amazing. Like, I just, man, yeah. I don't know what I'm going to be doing at 44, but... 
I mean, it's that's probably not the first now. badass she's, is what she's doing. She's 54 and was still on the podium at several UCI races this season. Yeah, <laughs> I had to have, like, my best race possible this year to beat her on the road. <laughs> I had to, like, pull out all the stops. I was like, oh, God, I don't know if I have it in me. <laughs> That was during Crit Week, right? Or yeah, in... that was during Crit Week. Oh, yeah, you were there. <laughs> uh, yeah, I wasn't there, we're going to say. I was like five or ten seconds behind that. <laughs> you were like, you were there. Yeah. It's in the group. Yeah, yeah, it was in the group. It's not like you got lapped or something. Oh. I'm. That's like my proudest thing right now is like I didn't get my ass kicked this summer. You're- you also do a lot of other stuff. You have the same amount of sports now that I had when I was... <laughs> 13 <laughs> not on purpose it's and i happens. think that's 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 the point of the podcast mm-hmm. but we also like to learn from those who are are quite skilled um i'm wondering ellen there we're talking about like sort of this long-term vision and i've been having this conversation with clients a lot lately you know similar in that you know everyone they might have this race this you know they're getting ready for cyclocross season or leadville or something this year and they have this one big big goal but it's hard i think especially maybe for master's age people to think, you know, in this way that you just described with Laura Van Gilder to think I am an athlete and I'm thinking long term. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm wondering, do you find, you know, even for yourself now, it's not like you're new to the sport. You've got what? 10 years. Oh, you're in, we'll say yeah, 10. you're going into <laughs> decade two. Yeah. Um, how do you, how do you take that long term view? You know what I mean? Like you have goals this year, but as you say, the sport of cycling, there is longevity there for you. You have time, mm-hmm. right? So do, do you think about this, I guess, that long term when to put things in perspective or when you're you're planning, I guess? I don't know. It's it's a vague question, but yeah, help the people. Yeah, that is like a definitely a big question. Um, but I think, yeah, I actually, I do have, I have so many long term goals Um, and I think it's important to have that balance, like kind of, I think it's harder for masters racers because like they have, they have so many components that they're working with outside of cycling that I think that it can be hard to balance. And like, I know a lot of my friends that don't race professionally that are masters racers or just like elite racers, um, that, yeah, they have a kind of a volatility to their career whereas or like their seasons and stuff like that whereas like sometimes you're like yeah work's been really stressful this year so I'm not really racing much or like money's super tight so I'm not racing very much and stuff like that so it can be hard to have those long-term goals um but I think I think that it's important because it keeps you as they say it's hard sometimes it can be hard to see the forest through the trees and I think being able to have that long-term view can keep you from just quitting after one bad race (laughs) because like for me I, I've had some like really hard kind of like extended periods of time where like, I feel like no matter what I do, my racing doesn't go well. Um, like last season was really hard. Like, yes, there were several, or like there were a couple of races that did go really well and I was happy, but like overall, like I wasn't racing to the level that I know that I'm capable of. And I think that if it hadn't been for me being like, I'm really like, I'm super devoted to the idea of going to the Olympics and like, like anyone in this sport, like I dream of someday winning a world championship or even an elite world championship medal would be just beyond. Um, so I think like with those goals, those are the things that are keeping me in this sport. Like when I'm like, yeah, I could walk away, <laughs> you know, but I'm like, no, 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 there's something left. And I had read, um, there, Ali Tetrick was on the cover of, I think it was bicycling. Yeah. And, and it was like, why did you come back? And she said, because this effing sport owes me something. And I think about that a lot. <laughs> and I thought it was just super powerful and it's really true where it's like when you have put so much into it it's like that investment illusion where it's like I expect to get something out of it like this sport owes me something um and so I think like having yes having that those things that you hope to get out of it at, at some point um keep you going when it's when it's really hard so I try to find that balance where it's like it's, it's I think it's a lot easier when I have when I have a team that like is super supportive absolutely like no doubt but like that you know they're depending on you for results um right so then like that keeps you motivated short term to like get good results then and then also yeah continue to look towards the long term and understand that they benefit each other mm-hmm. yeah i think that's 
That's good. Um, That's a really good answer, yeah. To a very vague question. Yeah. Um, yeah. Very vague. I wasn't even sure what you were asking, so... <laughs> I so, sometimes I don't know either, so I just I just start talking. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> Go. Go. I, I think that's it. good, right. and I think that's like we have had a couple questions. One was actually about you, and I'm trying to like work a, around it here. Okay. Um, and but sort of on this topic though, so you know, you, you and your definition of what a good race is has evolved, right? Like when you started and and first year pro, or maybe not even first year pro, I guess, but you know, you used to maybe be happy, you know, with whatever placing. I don't mm-hmm. know if that's true for you, though. So maybe this is difficult, but you're, you're, certainly your definition of when you have a shit race, like I saw you yeah. and you were quite upset at Pan Ams, for example, right? And right. and I understood that. Like, it's disappointing. You were really close, right? But like your race mm-hmm. was pretty good. Like, it was fine, yes. you know, and <laughs> that's the way racing goes, right? Like sometimes yeah, right. Right? it gets a little super cross and away we go. Um, <laughs> yeah. Right. And so what I guess I'm thinking is, so we have a master's person, they're chasing coach Al. So Alan's coach, uh, Al is legendary coach. And this is an actual example. I'm really confused. I got to find out how Al's training is the secret here. But, um, (laughs) so let's say we have a master's person who's chasing coach Al and coach Al is 10% faster. Yeah. Um, right now. Right. So their long-term view, I, I, and I think great points that you've brought up around lifestyle and, you know, there's going to be some undulation and seasonal or, or even yeah, race goals, yeah. but you know, their long-term goal, their world championships, their Olympics is beating coach Al. Yeah. Um, so I guess for you, then you have this Olympics, this world championships in the future, mm-hmm. but you know, you get second, which is shit. <laughs> okay, first of all, okay, I mean, this is a too- clean podcast. No, I can just change that to explicit. Um, it's okay. <laughs> so, so I guess what I'm saying is, how do you? And you don't have to even talk to that. You know, that that's very close uh, right now. Like it's recent. <laughs> but when when something's you know not perfect or or didn't go the seasonal goal, the race goal didn't go to plan. Do you have any thoughts or or how have you worked through? to to keep or get back on track and and keep it you know you're it's not that you're never going to win the olympics it's it's one race right like how do you deal with that i guess how do you reconcile that okay well a couple i think so there are multiple layers to that question first of all 18 questions no i I tried to pull it so we have masters person (laughs) shitty race world championships um so the biggest thing i do want to first say specifically for anyone listening the reason that pan ams was upsetting is because i made a really stupid pass and ended up crashing um so that's why that race was upsetting if i had ridden my best race and come across in second i actually wouldn't have been disappointed but i was like i was like banging my head against the wall i was i was genuinely so angry at myself because like i felt really good and we were going into the last lap together and it would have been such a good battle if i had kept my head on straight but I like I tried to win the race in a corner and like I tried to pass her and I way under or overestimated how much space I had and we turned sooner than I thought I had I thought I had time to jump her but we actually she ended up turning before I had made the pass and so ended up pushing me into the stake so that's why I was upset because I was like damn it I could have I could have passed her anywhere else on course I didn't need to pass her there and it's what lost me the race so and I think that kind of lends itself to the next part of the question which you had asked about like when you have a bad race yes my definition of a bad race is different now based on results focused goals but all I'm trying to do is still put together my best race on any given day and that's like that's really the only way that I think that's like really all that you can focus on with racing is process focused goals so it's like I prepared my best I tactically did my best. I ate the best food that I could. I slept well. I rode technically well. I prepared well. All of those things, those are my process focus goals and those will never change. Um, even if they, they become more specific or yes, like more, um, yeah, more specific is really the best way to put it. So the process focus goals never change. And the only way that I have results focus goals is by saying, based on previous data and based on previous results and previous experiences, I can reasonably expect that if I have my best process focused day, it could theoretically get me to this result. And so that's why I felt like based on previous days, if I put together my best race, I would have to have my best race to win Pan Ams. And I didn't. So 
but like that's where that's where the results focused versus um process focused goals come in is I only have process or results focused goals if I if I can base them off of like reasonable expectations of the process yeah um, so then that's the last great. question is how do masters racers stay focused when their world champs are beating Al? Was that the question? <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of factors there. No, and I think you're you're getting really to the the heart of the the concept. I think I love that you brought in process outcome goals. Um, we were actually just talking about that in the last episode too. So that's good that you've brought that up. I didn't just make it up. Yeah. Um, but what I'm thinking is, so you had a race that didn't go as planned. Mm-hmm. Um, then how do you reconcile that with, you know, in the future, you still have a chance at world championships, I guess. How do you get back on track? Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to tell you, I, th- it's different for everyone, but I'm going to tell you what I did after Pan Ams. I did an interview when I was like, yay. They were like, are you disappointed? And I was like, please get the camera out of my face. <laughs> I went back to the tent and I cried. I called my mom and I was like, I hate myself. <laughs> and I was like, okay, this is costing a lot of money. I'm going to go. Wiped my eyes, went to the podium. And then on the way home, I bought my mechanic and I blizzards from Dairy Queen. I ate it in the bathtub. Was really upset. And then I was like, you know what? I'm going to have to... I have worked like too... I've worked too hard to let this race be the thing that gets me down. And that's the biggest thing. Like when you feel like you're doing your best and you're performing to your best level every day, like that's what I always, that's what I tell the girls at the quest every year is like they get people that get like start line anxiety. It's like, you've done the work, trust that you have done the work. Like now's the fun part. Like all of the training and all of the preparation is trying to prepare you for this moment. Like we race because we love racing. Theoretically, if you don't, then maybe consider what you're doing. But like, if you love racing, then like that's now is the fun part. And so that's for me. I'm like, I've gone out and I've trained a lot and I've done a lot of hard work and I've spent a lot of time alone in foreign countries and like ridden through the rain. So like, I'm not going to let one result prevent me from reaping the benefits of all of the hard work that I've put in. Um, and I think that's where goals come in where it's like, ah, oh, damn it. That was like a really frustrating race. And I was like, just so mad at myself but eventually, like, I gave myself a little bit to be angry, and then I told myself, really, that I, like, I need to be kind to myself because that's something that I'm working on. And so I was like, okay, this this one race doesn't define you, and, like, you're going to go on to do other good things. Like, sometimes you just have to tell yourself something to get, it, to get through, and I haven't really had a good race since. I think I'm kind of having, like, a little bit of a plateau mid-season, um, but I'm feeling like I'm coming back around, and I know that... I really do know after a lot of like ups and downs in my career that it's all a part of it. I've been through it enough to know that it gets better. And yeah, I think I know that these things just fuel the fire and it makes the good results feel that much better. And I think there's probably an element too there where that experience that you got while costly in a lot of ways and frustrating. Um, I don't know how much blizzards cost in Canada, but I assume that was a costly mistake. But <laughs> oh no, it was worth every penny. I would have paid. I probably would have paid ten bucks to pop for a blizzard at that but, point. But but it's very likely that you'll find yourself in that exact same situation, possibly Eating with big. Or- uh, yeah, in the bathtub like that. Again. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> no, like with someone dueling, and maybe it yeah. will be for that world championships, right? And you may now have acquired more information or more patience. Okay, I ought to wait. I'm gonna have to take this to the line. Um, I'm gonna have to make my move earlier. Oh, are know. we talking about making mistakes to lose us the race, like I've done at the World Champs, at the Waterloo World Cup, at the Hama? Well, Landry sometimes Cross. it's all information. It's at all U.S. Information. Nationals. Yeah, well. <laughs> You know what? You have to learn that lesson, right? And then that's that's how it goes. It took me <laughs> ten years to win a provincial race. So I think you bring that race up every single podcast. Oh, I'm not I'm not we're not talking about <laughs> you're not gonna make me cry it's a again. Big deal. It it's is. a big deal. They're the provincial world championships. It's mm-hmm. not a it's not a small Mm-hmm. Okay, I want to get. I think we've taken the goals though. For I hope that answer. Yeah, the I was gonna say I actually want to get a little less esoteric and come back to the blizzard actually because 
I happen to know that getting a blizzard post race would not have been something you would have done, you know, two years ago or a year and a half ago. You've kind of gone, you've come a long way with regards to your nutrition, both on and off the bike. So, yeah, I, I would love it if you would just kind of talk it's, through your your evolution to where you are now. It's funny that <laughs> you would say that I've come a long way with regards to my nutrition because I'm eating a blizzard. I think that really goes. I think that really <laughs> demonstrates where we were at. <laughs> really, it'd be like two years ago, you would have eaten a blizzard after a race and now you're healthy. Tell us about it. But no, for me, like I've struggled with like eating issues for a long time. Like I've had like body image issues, like literally my whole life. Like I remember third grade, one of my other friends and I were both like, we were both athletic. Like we both did a lot of sports. Oh, I also raced dirt bikes and she also <laughs> raced dirt bikes. Um, I did that one a lot and we were both like athletic and kind of muscular. And I remember us talking, we were like, we're like the fattest girls in our class. Like this is third grade me saying that. Like Mm -hmm. I consciously knew that I, and I wasn't, but I felt like I was fat in third grade. So like that kind of set the tone for my life. Um, And, you know, like with, with these sorts of things like anxiety and, and the stress of life and especially like kind of the, the pressure of being a pro athlete at 2021. Mm -hmm. Um, it kind of got the best of me at one point. And like, it kind of felt at at a certain point, um, April, 2017, my life kind of fell apart (laughs) and I was piecing it back together, but I felt like I had missed so much training and I was about to go into my first season of racing road professionally. And I felt like I didn't have control over anything. So I decided to exercise an exceptional amount of control over what I was eating. And by taking control, it basically meant that I stopped eating almost altogether um, for a pretty long time. And unfortunately, like one of my coping mechanisms in life has always been to make jokes about stuff. So I was making jokes to my friends about how little I would be eating. Like we would, we would be getting breakfast and I'd get like a piece of toast and a salad. And I'd be like, yeah, this is probably all I'm going to eat for the rest of the day. Ha ha ha. And they were like, oh my God, that's really funny. (laughs) But I wasn't joking. Um, and so like I was getting cracked on like two hour rides, just getting like shelled out the back. Like I, I was struggling so much. Like I, I was getting dropped at races I had won the year before, like that sort of thing. Um, and finally I, I think Al, I think Al had noticed I was struggling a lot, um, after like, you know, a couple of months, like, and I just wasn't getting better and it just kept getting worse. Um, and so he was like, okay, like, how are you fueling for these rides? And I'm like, fueling for these rides? What are you talking about? Like, I'm trying to get skinny. And he was like, okay, that could explain it. Um, and so I just, I, like, started making some small changes, but really what I needed was to have, like, a real conversation with someone. So I ended up hiring a nutritionist. And it, like, it really changed everything for me because I had, I had someone with their PhD in nutrition giving me permission to eat foods to do better. And it like completely turned things around. Like it, I started eating carbohydrates and fats and proteins. I started eating all of it. And it was crazy because very slowly, like I had put on a ton of weight throughout this like crash diet period of like six months. I had put on quite a bit of weight and in the last year and a half without doing anything particular, like just by eating the foods that I needed and getting a lot faster and being able to pedal a lot harder, I lost 11 pounds. Like Mm -hmm. it's insane. And I've never, I've never mentioned that to anyone because I don't want it to seem like I'm encouraging weight loss. Like it was by virtue of me eating what my body needed that allowed my body to finally be like, okay, we can let go of this. Like, and I, I feel a lot better now, like with, with all this food, like I ate, I ate three pancakes for breakfast this morning and I had strawberries and bananas and I got home and I had, I had a protein shake and I'm going to have like salmon and rice and pesto for dinner. And I'm like so excited. Um, like I'm eating, I'm eating three meals a day and it's fantastic. Um, so it was like, it's been hard for me to talk about the nutritional thing because I don't even want to shed light on it to even put that thought in people's heads of like, Oh, like, she's insecure about her weight. Should I be insecure about mine? But at the end of the day, I realized that like, I've been through a lot of, I've been through a lot of phases of eating a lot that's healthy, eating a lot that's unhealthy. And then like finding that balance or like, then there's the not eating at all unhealthy. Um, And then I found that balance of like, 
eating really well when I can, but then also allowing myself to enjoy a blizzard if I want to, because like life is too damn short and they are good. Peter, I know that blizzards are like one of the only desserts that you indulge in. That's yeah, true. Also, uh, the Midland Dairy Queen thanks you for uh, this advertisement. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the Dairy finest Queen of the Dairy on my Queen. Instagram post. I was like, yes! <laughs> yeah, they're on top of their game. They are. Um, I think that's a really important... I mean, thank you for sharing that, because I think it is important for young females, but I think also for everyone. Like, I have, yeah. uh, from both sexes, master's clients that need to hear that advice, because they're struggling with that same thing. Like, the scale keeps going up, and they keep trying to train harder but eat way less and Mm. you know the feast and famine doesn't really work yeah and like that was the biggest thing for me was like the way that it had been explained to me and this is like total layman science now as I'll explain it but like when you're not really giving your body any food when it gets when it finally gets something it will hold on to it like for dear life because your body doesn't want to write checks that it can't cash So it wants to hold on to everything. So like, that's why when I started eating more, I was able to, or I just naturally leaned out because my body was like, oh, we have a a constant fuel source so we can burn this. Mm -hmm. Um, Whereas I think I gained weight because I, I was only eating like 500, 600 calories on like my big training, like 600 calories for like my three hour rides. And the rides, not like, the rides were crappy, out. right? You, and, and the rides were super yeah. crappy. I'm pedaling around at like a hundred watts. So you're putting out less output, like wattage, yes. which is yep. an energy, right? So there's less energy mm-hmm. going out too. Um, and yeah, then so, post-workout, there's less to recover from. Body's yeah. metabolism's all down. Yeah, it's a bad. But yeah, it's such so an it's easy thing really to fall fiction. into. Yeah, yes. it makes sense at the same time, right? <laughs> it's so easy to fall into. Like, it is almost counterintuitive to be like, I eat more and then I lose weight. But once you've like, once you've done it, you're like, oh my god. So yeah, it's been really, it's been like a, it's been an ongoing process. Um, but it's been probably like the most important process that I've had to kind of trust in my career. Um, but. Yeah, I really, I really believe in it. And then I think the other thing too is like if you can, if you can give yourself those treats every now and then, it really helps you prevent those binges. And like that's for me, like one of my favorite things to do is I have a protein shake after literally every ride. Like even if it's just a recovery day, I have protein once I get through the door. Um, and having like a dose of protein with a bit of carbohydrate, like normally sweet. So like I'll do like a like the goo, uh, goo energy like chocolate smoothie um protein powder and i love it because it's it's kind of sweet so it like satiates that that craving that you have to like binge food after your ride um so for me it's been really good because it's kind of like leveled out that like that food those crazy food cravings that i get and it like it makes me not crave dessert before bed which i think a lot of people do like i think you always want something sweet before you sleep but for me, having like a kind of like a sweet drink after my ride has really helped me like level out. Um, so giving yourself those daily, like that daily treat of protein for me is really nice. And then like, yeah, giving yourself a treat every now and then at DQ, like there's nothing wrong with that. And it keeps you from like buying a whole thing of Oreos and then eating them all in one go or something. <laughs> right. Definitely. Right. Okay. Random question. This yeah. is unrelated to beating Al. Yes. Oh, boy. <laughs> um, and it's unrelated to you specifically. Like, don't read too much into it. But if you were okay. going to say, like, I'm training for cyclocross, and I only yeah. can train for 30 minutes twice a week, so two 30-minute workouts. Okay. Uh, and this is, like, close to cyclocross season two, so we'll ignore any sort of, like, time of year thing. Um, okay. You're just preparing for cyclocross. What would you do with those two 30-minute? It can be the same or it can be different. Oh, um, base, this is only based off of something that I've heard in passing. Um, I would probably say 40 twenties. Okay. So micro intervals. So for the full, mm-hmm. like sort of warm like up, over-unders. warm up. And then how, how long would you do those? I do 10 minute blocks. So okay. however many 10 minute blocks so you, maybe you can get, get in it. like two by two by eight or two by 10, maybe if you're lucky. 
Yeah. I'm assuming you're going to warm up. Uh, but then, but it's quite hard because if you can only ride for 30 minutes, like you're not doing any sort of aerobic or threshold work to get to the 4020s. So mm. you could mix it up. You could do say. one one of the threshold days. And okay. One of those would probably be good. So one. yeah, one day would be like threshold and then one day would be 4020s. Yeah. And then really the other thing that you can do is take 60 seconds at the end of every ride and adjust your expectations and understand that if you're only able to ride 30 minutes twice a week, that's totally fine. Life gets in the way, but just be able to adjust your expectations and realize like you're not, you may not be able at this point in time to be competitive with the masters racers that train like they're pros. Cause there, there are a lot of them out there that right. like that and, like, and have raced as pros. Yes. And have raced as pros. So <laughs> I would say, yes, 60 seconds of the 30-minute ride needs to be like, this is the best that I can do with what I have. So why I like that question is not necessarily because there's that person out there, I'm sure there is, who, who trains yes. two times 30, and that's hopefully helpful for them. But also then, I like to then, when I ask it to myself usually, is then how much of that have I been doing? And that could be micro intervals and threshold generally. Or, oh, yeah. Right? So then when you look, back not again this isn't applying to you necessarily but it does sort of give us a bit of a window into okay well what does ellen sort of okay maybe some micro intervals and some threshold um, yeah so it's somewhat theoretical but also just sort of trying to get into what someone's like philosophy or what they think cyclocross or whatever yeah discipline is. well it's funny i'm i've been racing for a long time and i literally just the other day had to have a conversation with al about like I, I tried to tell him, I was like, well, why do I need to do that? Because we're never going to see efforts like that in a race. And he was like, he's so patient with me, even still after eight years of working together. He's like, <laughs> he explains like the whole thing to me as to why, even though I'm not seeing five minute efforts in a race, we're still doing five minute intervals. <laughs> so yeah, sometimes you need the friendly reminder from your coach when <laughs> your dumb brain thinks that you know everything and then you realize that you don't. <laughs> so if, yeah, if he was like an older coach, or, or less patient he'd probably like yeah. say something about like five fingers and stupid athlete or something like that and away you go <laughs> yes yeah, but bless him he's like he's like so here's why i'm like oh thank you so much you're totally right and he's like i know <laughs> <laughs> yes i'm aware thank you <laughs> Um, I was actually, when you said the two thirty minutes, I was starting to think about skills training. That's kind of what popped up in oh, my head because it. Ellen, like obviously skills are sort of one of your major strong points. And we have to talk about the bunny hopping of the barriers. So yes. I feel like I want you to explain to people that it's not a thing that you learned one day and then magically did in a race the next weekend. Explain yes. the process <laughs> behind oh, this whole it's thing. Years. It's, it was years of bunny hopping and practicing. It's actually, I was thinking about this today. Um, I don't know if either of you guys listen to Ariana Grande. It doesn't really fit your goth style, Molly, and Peter doesn't fit your aesthetic either, but she has this new song and she's like talking about her boyfriends, her, her exes. And it's one taught me love, one taught me patience, one taught me pain. And I was thinking about jumping, like hopping the stairs, um, like the Belgian steps taught me mm -hmm. love. Because it was like easy, fast, just like and super sick. One taught me patience, which was the barriers because it took a long time. And then one taught me pain, um, which is wheeling because I'm still not good at it. Like I'm still not good at wheeling after how many years of practicing. Um, so those were that's what I was thinking about. But if anyone has listened to Ariana Grande's new song, it will make more sense. But anyway, um, hopping barriers took forever. And I, I was willing to crash and hurt myself during the process. If you're not willing to take the risk, then practice practice running and get really fast at it. First things first. Like I had a conversation with yeah, Compton again where she was like, it's cool what you're doing. I'm not like I don't want to do that stuff anymore. She's like I like going out on my rides and getting it done and being done. She's like I don't want to do those like silly training rides <laughs> like those silly silly things anymore. I was like I respect the hell out of that. <laughs> like that self-awareness to know that you want to do that stuff. Um, but for me, it was something that I really wanted to do because I was so sick of the like riding with my guy friends and then them all being able to jump stuff and then me having to like either slow down and like kind of like tic tac onto a curb or like not be able to get over a big log in the woods or something like that. Or yeah, yeah even pre-riding the course when all of your friends are jumping and then you ruin the jump line. Um, so for me, I, 
I decided to learn it like when I was still on the jam fund, like many years ago, um, I started doing it and it wasn't until my second season on Aspire that I finally did it in a race. So it took three seasons of like kind of slowly working, working myself through it and being really patient, as I said. And I mean, you had years of mountain biking before that and yes. like you're still progressing. There's still, you know, your bunny hop world championship medal is, is still in the future, right? Like you still have room to grow. Like it's not an end point, uh, right? No, no, absolutely. Like doing it in a race was the first step of many for me. Like, and the truth is like it, it does have like very practical applications. Like it's great during races. It's great to be able to like jump onto a sidewalk at speed. Um, and like, it's super, super, super applicable to mountain bike racing, but I'd say it's a lot easier to do on a, uh, like dually than on a cyclocross bike. Like cyclocross bikes aren't meant to be jumped, but we do it anyway. Um, but yeah, for me, I feel like I, I tic tac, like I do two distinct motions to get over the barriers and I found out a way, I found a way to do it fast. Um, but really my new goal is to learn how to J hop, which is like the BMX style bunny hop, um, that I could do very fast. And so like, that's kind of what I'm working on. So like, if you watch Vanderpool hop barriers and people are like, Oh my God, ah, <laughs> he's J hopping. Like it's really hard to tic tac as they say. Um, at speed. Jeremy does it. I do it, but, um, it's not as sick. And when you say that you're, you're meaning that you're putting your front wheel and sort of tapping really softly or as softly as possible, you're tapping the top of the very, very skinny barrier and then sort of pushing yourself over from there. Yeah. It doesn't, people always want to like, I don't think that you have to, I don't normally touch the barriers. I mean, sometimes I will hit it. Like if you case the barrier, but the tic tac is less important about like touching the barrier and more just about like you're seeing my arms do two distinct motions. Whereas a J hop, you're essentially making a J shape with your handlebars. Like it's one fluid motion. Mm-hmm. It mostly comes down to if you watch it in slow-mo, that's the only way that you can tell. <laughs> Fair enough. But the point teams. being, you continually are practicing this skill that took a really oh, long yeah. time. Yeah, 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 absolutely. It's, <laughs> I, um, I was hanging out with, one of my friends and I was trying to learn how to wheelie and he's really good at wheeling. And I was getting frustrated because even though I like have the respect of knowing that it takes a long time to learn how to hop barriers, I just wanted to be able to learn how to wheelie instantaneously. And he's like, if we were both 13, 13 year old me would laugh at 13 year old you for thinking that like, you're just going to learn this. He's like, I rode, I wheelied all day, every day, like for hours and hours and hours. Like, it's offensive that you're frustrated right now. <laughs> so yeah, be kind to yourself and enjoy the process of learning a new skill. Like as you get older, we rarely learn new skills and certainly don't give ourselves the room or like the support to learn something slowly. So mm-hmm. enjoy that process. I'm learning photography right now and it's taking a very long time <laughs> and I'm trying to be patient with that. Yeah, that's one that I've never been able to master. There's there's too much precision involved. That and like film, I'm just useless. Yeah. <laughs> Peter's just Yeah, when I when things. I bought your camera, it was on auto. So Yeah, exactly. And <laughs> it pretty much went between auto and sport mode. Yep. <laughs> no regrets. <laughs> I've tried. I've taken so many different like classes and downloaded so many books and I just don't have the headspace for it. It's fine. Yeah. That's my that's my thing. Everything's fine. Yeah, everything's <laughs> fine. Okay, I think we're holding this lady long enough. Yes, I do want to wrap up, but obviously we have to talk about the fact that nationals are coming up. How are you yeah. feeling? I'm really excited. I actually had a really, really, really good training ride today, which was very exciting. Um, I'm here in Athens, Georgia right now doing some kind of, I mean, warm weather training, um, whatever that means, but yeah, I'm excited. And we were talking about process focus goals. And for me, that's the biggest thing is like, based on the season I've had, I know that my brain knows how to win a race. And I think like going into this year, I know that I'm in a good place, but I need to, yeah, I just need to be able to put together a really good day. Um, to be a factor, mm-hmm. but Compton is and has been unbeatable. So it's going to be, it's kind of hard. And then of course, Keo is always a wild card as well. And it's, I think it's going to be a really good race to watch. Um, mm-hmm. So I'm super excited, but 
it comes down to like, yeah, if I'm, if I'm first, second, third, fifth, like if I come across the line and I have not a single drop of energy left in the tank and I put together the best race possible, then I can't be disappointed. Of course. I mean, who doesn't, if you're, if you're a professional and you're not going to nationals hoping to win, then I don't really know what to say. Um, but for me, of course, winning nationals is the goal. Um, but I can't, if it's, if that's not in the cards for the day, then I I can't, I'm not going to let that get in the way of the rest of my goals for the season, as we talked about. Awesome. And for people who've been living under rocks, where can everyone find you on the interwebs? Oh God. My handle is Ellen likes bikes on Twitter and Instagram. And I'm on Facebook barely at facebook.com slash Ellen Noble cyclist. Yes. And you have Ellen Noble.com too, right? Oh yeah, I do. So I have ellennoble.com. There are sometimes updates on there. Um, and that's the easiest way to contact me via email is through the contact part of my website. So if we always say, if this podcast inspires you to ask a bunch of questions or you just want to send me a nice note, not a mean note, but a nice one. No mean notes. Contact me via my website. I have this one guy who is so sweet. He writes me emails quite often. And at the end of every one, he includes a photo that he took. He works with animals, I guess. So he's like, here's your kangaroo of the day. And he sends me them. And it is so sweet. Like, when you get, like, a bunch of emails that are like, the patriarchy doesn't exist and you suck. And then you get an email that's like, here's your daily kangaroo. You're like... Oh my God, bless your heart. <laughs> All right, so yeah, everyone, please send Ellen cute animal photos. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you so much, Ellen, as always. Uh, thanks, it's guys. Great chatting with you. Yes, this was really nice. I'm going to go have a handsome piece of salmon for dinner. Thanks so much for tuning into the Consummate Athlete Podcast. Uh, You can check out my stuff over at theoutdooredit.com or by following me on Instagram and Twitter at Molly J. Herford. And you can check out Peter's coaching, training plans, blogs, all that fun stuff over at smartathlete.ca or by following him on Twitter and Instagram at Peter Glassford. And if you want to support this show and other awesome podcasts, please check out wideanglepodium.com for show info, other podcasts, bonus content, and to become a donating member so you can get all of that rad behind-the-scenes content and help keep shows like this on the air. And lastly, if you're enjoying this podcast and all the information that we're bringing to you every single week, uh, do us a solid and pop into iTunes to leave us a rating and review. It takes you about two seconds. You can do it on your computer. You can do it on your phone. And it really helps us out. Thanks so much, and we will see you next week. <laughs>